Well, welcome everyone. This is our second installment on this Bible study and discussion on religion and politics in America. Well, Richard, uh, you are with me for this one, and I thank you for that. Richard is a member of our congregation, but he also happens to be a student in my classroom this semester at Florida Gulf Coast University on this topic. Uh, he's auditing the class, which uh, those who are of retirement age here can do that for free at Florida Gulf Coast if the teacher allows it and it doesn't uh, knock some other students out of the classroom. Um, and uh, the good news about auditing, right, Richard, is you don't have to take the tests. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but you can still be in the discussions. Um, right. I'm still, I'm, and I'm thinking of writing a paper. Ah. Because I think it'd be good for me to uh, take this huge amount of information you're presenting and boil it down to what um, I know and understand. Okay. Cool. So, yeah, the students are to uh, write a paper at the end of the class on their philosophy their yeah. personal philosophy of how religion and politics are to work together in our society. What's the best way to do that? Um, and it's kind of a challenge. I don't know how well I would do with that paper. <laughs> um, well, well, you'll get, uh, I'll, I'll put it on uh, hard <clears throat> copy so that you, okay. you get a chance to read it sometime. All right. Sounds good. Hey, so um, what's your impression of the course so far that we uh, that I, that's been uh, going on in at FGCU? Well, first of all, there's tremendous amount of information, and I'm amazed at how you were able to actually research so much and then uh, come down to putting it into a course frame a framework, and you. Um, you may not feel that everything is working out the way you wanted it to, but that's pretty normal. It takes about three years, I think, of going through material to and teaching a course to get yeah. it to a point where you're more satisfied with it. But um, so far, I think it's stimulating and it's challenging a lot of ideas. I mean, it's uh, we go from 130 to 415 and I don't have too much of a problem staying awake. Okay. <laughs> and, That's good. And, and the other philosophy course I've ever taken, I did. <laughs> ah. Hey, um, and I think the quality of the students in the classroom is pretty good. Very, imp yeah, it is very impressive. The kids, yeah. the kids are picking it up. And when you switched us, switched our groups around a little bit. I got it to meet other people. And there were a couple of kids in there. I thought, oh, they're being overwhelmed. But you know, in the discussion, I realized they were not. They Good. are Good. I Good. I think they're doing well. Yeah. And this is different than that. Um, this is a discussion and Bible study. So we bring in more of the Christian emphasis. But I think what I'm teaching in the classroom uh, kind of strip away some of the Christian terminology, but it's about the same principles. I think, as I mentioned, I think uh, in the first uh, Bible study discussion that was just me doing a monologue, Richard, um, was is that good theology turns into good practice. Um, and when there are, quote, heresies or false understandings of things like how church and state should work together, or a false understanding like um, that we talk, like Christian nationalism, the, the conflation of uh, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world in such a way, uh, that brings about bad uh, practices and even destructive things. Um, so I think there's a lot, it's, it's a fun class to teach even if uh, there may be restrictions on how I advocate for anything um, as an instructor in that. But in this Bible study, I get to kind of 
spell out what I believe the scriptures are saying on, on these subjects as well. Yeah. Before we get in, let's uh, start with the prayer though, okay? Mm -hmm. You're good with that? I think yes. you'd like to pray, yeah. No. All right, you, would you like to lead the prayer, Richard? No, why don't you do it? Okay. Lord God, thank you for this afternoon. Thank you for um, the wisdom that you've given Richard. Uh, thank you for this ability to discuss a tough topic in our society, one that we really need to figure out a little more. And what I'm hoping, Lord, that you would give your church, your people here in the United States and around the world, uh, a clearer understanding of your gospel, the kingdom, the way you want us to be in this world, how we are both citizens in this world, but our uh, ultimate citizenship is in heaven. It is with you. Uh, we operate by your uh, will and your standards. We ask for your kingdom to come and your will to be done on earth as well as heaven. And we pray, Lord, this discussion is fruitful for all who would listen and would uh, build us up as well in your word, in your truth, and in our Christian witness in this world. We do pray for our nation. It's going through difficult times in our world too, Lord. We especially lift up Ukraine and the Christians there, as well as the rest of the people who are facing such atrocities. We pray too that you would raise up your church, both in Ukraine and in Russia and around the world to speak out against injustices and against uh, totalitarianism in any form. Our ultimate uh, authority is you, Lord Jesus, not anything on this earth and our allegiance is with you ultimately, Lord. And you've set up government in such a way that it can be your servant, Lord, and is to serve the people, Lord, to bring order and decency in society. So often though, Lord, it's become destructive and beastly in different ways. We pray, Lord God, that you would limit the negative effects as, and that you would also help Christians participate in a way that is both beneficial and faithful, faithful to your word and truth and beneficial for society and for human flourishing on this wonderful world you created. All these things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, Richard. Um, so one of the questions we ask at the beginning, uh, and I've kind of used rhetorically through the class, and I think in this study, is a quotation, a question actually from Tertullian. He was an early church father who said, what has Jerusalem to do with Athens? These are the two things that we still struggle to try to figure out how these two fit together. Jerusalem representing faith and revelation and Athens representing philosophy, politics, uh, community in this world. That's the big question, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Well, how do you keep uh, how do you keep each in its own realm? Right. And how does Jerusalem benefit Athens? Before we jump into the Bible passage, um, I brought up last time, and just um, <clears throat> maybe I want you to comment on those three basic views. This comes from um, James Davison Hunter's book. Uh, he calls uh, these more or less the liberal social justice view, um, the neo-Anabaptist separatist view, and the conservative dominionist view. That is the liberal, um, some of the liberal churches look uh, at the number one effect that church, the Christian church should have on politics is to promote social justice and equity, and they lobby for that as a political organization. Uh, the neo-Anabaptist churches, these are those who believe that we just do our thing and separate ourselves completely from being involved in government. Uh, some of them would promote not ever being involved in military service 
as well. So the Amish traditionally would fall into this category, but Neo-Anabaptists, there are those who basically are from within different Christian denominations that still think this way too. It's not just like the Amish. And then uh, the conservative dominionist view is more or less what we see promoted by some politi uh, political, theological, religious leaders. And we would call that more or less Christian nationalism, where we see they want to, um, the point is to create <clears throat> uh, Christians to dominate politics and to legislate morality and uh, Christian worldviews that basically um, marginalize certain groups within society, I would say. But, and we see some of that evidence going on too. What are your thoughts on these alternatives, Richard? Well, um, I guess the gospel drives my mm -hmm. um, views. Um, the Lord said we we should love God, mm -hmm. and we should love um, our neighbor mm -hmm. as we as we want to be loved, mm -hmm. as we would love ourselves, and that drives my opinion uh, in relationship to, to these three. The first one is more in line with that. It's it's saying what government should do is to serve the people. Yeah. And it seems to me, and um, the the whole idea of social justice uh, also fits in the Old Testament. Um, God wanted his people to take care of the widows, the orphans, the people that were, um, were not privileged in any way in the society. They were not to be ignored. Right. And there were there were ways for them to do that, and and so on. In fact, um, they they even set set together a year of jubilee. God mm -hmm. ordained a year of jubilee. The Jews, I don't think, ever did it. They never did that we that, know of. There's no record of it. But that year, <laughs> that year of jubilee, really, and. If people aren't aware of it, it is that it was to be done every 50 years. Right. And through no fault of people, whatever, um, they maybe hit on bad times. They became very poor. Mm -hmm. They had to sell their land. Now, that land was given to them through the tribes. And, right. Uh, in, the, in this year of Jubilee, the land was to be given back. Correct. And okay. there was a back to kind of an equilibrium that every uh, person, every ch every family among Israel would again be part of the inheritance and yes. not be uh, separated out. Any one who had become an indentured servant to another would be freed. Yes. Uh, well, any well, debts would be canceled. Yes. Well, my point is, there, there's this strong social justice thread right. throughout the Bible, okay? Uh, the Neo-Baptists, that idea, the idea of remaining separate, that just bothers me because um, the Lord said, you know, we should be in, the, the idea is that we should be in the world mm -hmm. as Christians. Well, we are. <laughs> like it or not, you are, but, yeah. not, of it, but not of it. Right. I mean, that means... We should be a, we should have a presence in our communities, and that presence is there. We're there so that we can care for one another. We could serve serve the neighbor um, mm -hmm. that needs help. That we can do things for people that would share Christ's love. Right. Okay. And. Um, we could be conduits then for the love of God into to our neighbors. And then the last one, the conservative uh, dominionisms, the problem I have with that, that is they seem to seem to take the um, 
And what's the best way of putting it? They seem to, they seem to be taking the power of the state as more important than the transformative power of the love of Jesus. Yeah. Uh, Christ, Christ loved me, and that knowledge has, has been a transformative, has changed me. Right. And I don't see how else we can, you know, impact society unless we're willing to share that kind of love and believe fully that people being helped, people being listened to, people being cared about um, can transform the situ the place that we live. Right. So, okay. yeah, a couple caveats before you move on. I think one is that um, the old testament or the prophetic tradition as you rightly claimed uh called on israel to uh, treat the marginalized like the orphan the widows and the foreigner in their midst uh th those who were among them that were poor etc um to try to give them a, a hand up a step up um some equal footing it wasn't a where everybody's treated equally, but where everybody, whatever position you were in, you use it for the sake of the whole community and not just for self. However, uh, one caveat to that is that Israel was a unique situation of being both what we would say church and state together. Um, yes. It's not quite the same to, and I think there can be some confusion by some of the liberal uh, groups to say, is this the best way to try to bring about social justice by expecting the state to do it all? Or is this the church's role to help the widow, the orphan, et cetera? And it's, it, there are good questions that way. Um, secondly, I think also the liberal um, social justice kind of churches tend to still use politics as their means, legislation, um, new laws, enforcement, et cetera, uh, as the method rather than just out of the power of the gospel. I, I personally, as, um, as someone who's, you know, a pastor, I think often when it comes to church state issues, it's often a confusion of law and gospel where the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the only power that changes me and transforms me, is sidelined. And we somehow think that the law is going to solve the problem. And uh, the law may point out the problem, but it doesn't necessarily solve it. So not against legislation, but I think that's an issue as well. So. Uh, and I think James Davison Hunter basically calls on all three of these alternatives as three different ways that people still politicize the issue rather than seeing politics has its place, but it's not going to solve community issues and all the issues. We think somehow politics will solve everything. And I don't see that happening often. Um, anyways, that's a few thoughts. He has that fourth alternative, which I shared last time. Uh, which is called faithful presence, uh, that we are present in the community, but we, uh, we live differently, but we also try to create more culture, to create new systems to be a part of uh, society, but also realize the ultimate answers are not going to be found in politics to these issues. Does that make sense? Well, I'm no, because yes, I mean, yes, it does. <laughs> no. now, my reason for my reason for saying that is ultimately it comes down to self self awareness, mm -hmm. and it comes comes down to appreciating the fact that I'm a sinner. I need to yeah. change. Yeah, yeah, and um, that doesn't. That doesn't happen through law. I mean, yeah. people get put, put in jail all the time. Sometimes they, <laughs> sometimes they change, but there's an awful lot of 
I think research is so, shows recidivism is yes, really high. Yeah. It's hard to get out of that. Okay. We're going to look at, this is a Bible study. We're going to do some Bible. Okay. So, um, do you have before you the passage from Philippians chapter three? Yeah. Why don't you read that? Okay. But our citizenship is in heaven and from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to, to subject all things to himself. What's fascinating to me in this passage, that word for citizenship only occurs here in the New Testament. Um, and it is, it's got the word polity or um, political in it um, because the city states of Athens and other places like Sparta uh, are called polis or politics this is where we get the word from. Uh, but it's interesting and, and the best translation in English is citizenship. What do you think Paul was getting at to say our citizenship is in heaven? Um, once again, it's um, we're in the world, but not of it. Okay, and that uh, I think of. I'm a mem I'm part of the kingdom of Christ. Right. That's a spiritual kingdom. Yeah. And I and I'm thinking that's what he is talking about. My citizenship is really fundamentally um, in the kingdom, right. the, in Christ's kingdom. Yeah, and and so in other words. Um, you know, just like in this nation, we follow certain rules, you know, we drive on the right side of the road, all that type of stuff. I think he's talking about the fact that we take our cues for how we act and conduct our lives from Jesus Christ and not from the nation state that we happen to be in. And so we look to live and follow Jesus, to be more like him, to, you know, to exemplify or have produced in us the fruit of the spirit, the love, joy, peace, patience, the character of Jesus Christ. And in any circumstance, I am representing his kingdom, uh, his way of ruling in this world, his way of being uh, in this world. Um, I'm kind of an ambassador for that kingdom. Yes. Right. So well, um, I, the, the concept that came up to me here is this concept of reset, resentment. Rese yeah, so, that was in I, James I, 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 Because, you know, um, so many people are angry in our society. And what happens is um, something, they may resent someone uh, someone in their community, someone who has power, somebody who has an education, and so on, and, and look to see that they have more than I have. And so there's, what, what happens is it's not just be, re, being resentful, you add to that an anger, uh, you add to that um, uh, envy, Right. Things, like, things like this. And that then can be used to fuel, um, you know, political ends. Right. Right. And I think um, so what Richard was referring to resentment uh, comes up in this book, James Davison Hunter. He thinks that the majority of people right now in our culture are in that state of being told and believing that they are um, a minority group. Everyone feels like they are marginalized. Everyone feels like they've been taken advantage of. So the middle class, white Americans, black Americans, African, you know, any group, immigrants, non-immigrants, and you hear it in our politics where it's like that group over there, you know, was the, um, 
goes back a ways where the welfare queen was brought up in the 1980s as how terrible, you know, these people get everything for free, you know, and it was resentment is what was being used in politics to drive the agenda. And it pits one group against another. And I just don't find anywhere in the New Testament, if our citizenship is in heaven, it's not motivated by resentment. It's not motivated by uh, feeling disenfranchised. In fact, if we are persecuted, we're supposed to rejoice because Jesus himself was. Uh, we don't, we don't like try to get back at. Um, and what's funny, I think, Richard, is I've seen people kind of display and Christians who think, oh, we're being so persecuted in the United States. I just can't believe. And so they play the role of being the victim. And I look at the United States compared to the world. Christianity is not being persecuted. There are a few instances here and there, but it's so marginally small compared to the majority of uh, opportunities that we have. Mm -hmm. And you don't even see Paul protesting. In his day, when he wrote to the Philippians, he was in jail. Yep. You know, he was in jail for his faith. Yep. He wasn't telling them, you know, you should feel like persecuted and resentful and start protesting and telling the government off. And he never did that. And that government was corrupt. That government was authoritarian. And I'm not advocating for having any of that. I'm just saying it's just amazing how the attitude was, you're a citizen of heaven, live by the way that Jesus would have you live as that citizen and encountered the world from that position. Yep. I, I had, I've had numerous experiences on just this, exactly this, this thing. I'm, I remember one time I was talking to somebody and I knew this fellow, okay? He was, mm -hmm. uh, he was a Mexican-American, okay? Hispanic fellow. I'd known him for, for a long time in town and he, had, he, had a, he was running a business. And one of my friends said, yeah, that, there's an example. He is an immigrant and he's come, to, come now and he's taken jobs away from people and, and all of his family is doing that. And I said, and I said to my friend, do you realize that uh, you and your family have yeah. been here a shorter period of time? This guy's family goes back 400 years. Right. Some... He, had, he had come from New Mexico. You know? <laughs> and they didn't realize that. They didn't yeah. realize that. So it's the other, you know, branding the other right. rather than, than seeing a human being there. Right, right. Yeah, and I think um, the next Bible passage I've got is from uh, I, from Peter's letters, First uh, Peter 2, and I think helps us understand a little more what this citizenship looks like and how we are to live and conduct ourselves in this world, whatever nation we happen to be in. Can you uh, read 1 Peter 2, 9 through 12? Yes. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you, you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God in the day of visitation. Yeah, there's so much here. I think we could spend the rest of our time on this passage. And it's worth really anyone who's watching and being part of this to just have this one to sit down with it and just marinate, you know, like have it just kind of flow through you. So um, it's interesting too, uh, we're called 
halfway through this, he says, I urge you as sojourners and exiles. Isn't that fascinating? Um, another term, uh, one book um, that might be worth reading for you, Richard, is uh, called Resident Aliens. And um, I believe Stanley Hauerwas and Will Williman are the authors. And this is where they get it from that we are residents here, but we're still not quite at home. We're like expats. Uh, we're citizens of heaven, and we happen to be in this country at the same time. And we're gonna love this country and care about this country. Or um, I think Peter's getting at the idea of just like Israel were exiles in Babylon and Jeremiah called on them, to seek the prosperity of the place to which they lived, even though it wasn't, quote, home. Uh, so we are exiles in our Babylon, that we don't quite fit into our society, and yet we seek the peace and prosperity of this place, knowing that we're just uh, passing through, that this kingdom of this world and this nation will not last forever, but God's kingdom does. And so conduct ourselves honorably so they can't really find fault with us. And that's, I think, what's bothered me, Richard. I don't know about you. Sometimes when I see how Christians have acted in the last couple political um, cycles, I'm not sure how how that squares with this verse, conduct yourselves among the Gentiles honorably, honor, uh, so that when they speak uh, against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. I mean, I've seen Christians yelling and screaming and pushing and shoving and, you know, filled with fear and anger. I just don't see any of that fitting in with this verse. Any comments on that? Yeah, the first day I, I, I walked across campus <laughs> at FGCU to your class, I was assaulted by the gospel. Well, you I know, don't think it's the gospel at all. It was the law, but, but go ahead. I was assaulted by people who said they were Christians. Yeah, <laughs> yelling and insulting yelling. students. Yes, absolutely. Humiliating students. Yeah, uh, I just thought it, this was the most ridiculous display of so a Christian witness I have ever seen, and it certainly yeah. wasn't a Christian witness. Um, the I wanted to make a comment about the concept of the sojourner. Yeah, that that resonates has resonated with me because I've I was f felt like I've not quite been a part of that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I read a, a science fiction novel by Robert Heinlein many years ago, probably 50 years ago. And maybe, no, maybe it's 60 years ago. Um, and it was called Stranger in a Strange Land. Mm. And it was about this experience of not of of showing up on this planet but not fitting into into the populace, mm -hmm. and then um, when you when you, if you read Abram, it's so similar. It was so similar. It just really struck me. Abram just walked as a sojourner, walked in trust with the Lord that this is what he was to do. This is where he was to go. He was in that world, but he wasn't of it. Right. You know, yes, all? it does. And in fact, that's one of the main themes of the Bible is that God's people are always a pilgrim people, always on a journey. And any time in our lives when we look for our ultimate happiness and ultimate home right here, right now, that's when things really go south fast. I think it happened with Israel in both the North and the Southern Kingdom in the Old Testament, when they started to basically equate themselves with the kingdom of God fully, and that now, hey, we're here, we've arrived. 
and then all sorts of um, injustices broke loose in their society when they settled and tried to gain and create this into the kingdom of God in that way. Um, and then God put them in exile. And I think the early church knew well their exile status. And uh, Peter brings that up here. But when I have a feeling after the Constantinian, you know, Constantine, when he legalized Christianity and used it for political ends himself, and Christians got comfortable with the state a little too much, we started seeking um, God's kingdom right here on earth in a fullness and equated that too much with the power and the structures that we humans could create. And that's mm-hmm. always been a problem, right? Yeah. yeah. We, we need to remain um, sojourners or understand, you know, this is not our home. Your ultimate yes. happiness is not going to be here. Um, I love Jürgen Moltmann put it this way, Richard. He said that we should have a nostalgia for the future. <laughs> where yeah, we're that's... looking to that golden age, if you want to put it that way, the yep. wonderful time when everything comes together in God's kingdom and its yep. fullness. And until and, then, you, you, you just hope that this change, you know, the people who are sojourners make a change, do go someplace, and they're hoping that this is the place, you know, that's going to um, enable them to belong, to fit in. I, I read a book. Uh, I think it was called Splendor of Many Sons. And mm-hmm. it's all about it's all about the black my black people migrating out of Oh Mississippi yeah, 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 yeah. To various parts of the country. That's what they were doing. They they became sojourners. They left communities that they knew, but they came became sojourners in search of. Okay. Um, right. And a lot of um African-American spirituals deal with that. You know, they talk about this wandering, this sojourning, this coming, looking for the promised land in the future. And somehow I think um, our Christianity for a lot of it has gotten too satisfied with the here and the now. And uh, uh, in the book of Revelation, which we just finished a study on, the seven letters, a couple of them go to churches that basically got self-satisfied and the Christians were, you know, in Laodicea, yes. I'm rich, I'm well off, everything's great. And Jesus has to say to them, you're poor, wretched and blind. You're yep. lukewarm and you don't realize it. You have, uh, you have gotten too comfortable with your comfort level. And um, hmm, that's always a challenge. Um, We're going to finish this off, I think, Richard, with um, I'm going to read a part of the passage from Jeremiah again. Okay. And um, I think that's going to be uh, helpful uh, to just talk about that, because when he talks to the exiles in Jeremiah 29, um, he says that halfway through this passage, I think it's verse seven, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams that they dream for it is a lie. What they were prophesying to them. Oh, it's a short time. Don't get Don't settle in, don't care about this, don't do anything, just just be ready to go back because you're gonna go back soon. Um, And he goes on and says, when 70 years are completed, I will visit you and I'll fulfill my promise to you and bring you back to this place. But I love that passage. So they are in exile. How How do you act in exile? You don't act like you don't care about the place you are. You are to seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you. And Mm -hmm. God sent us into exile. God sent Mm -hmm. Israel into exile. 
we were sent into exile by Jesus. He says, go into all the world. And I don't think all the world just means geographically. It means into every aspect of this world, into every part of the culture. And so that we are to uh, pray for the peace and prosperity of this place, um, to pray to the Lord on its behalf, for it's in its welfare you will find your welfare. So Christians don't become detached and separated out of this world in such a way that we don't care about this world, but from our position as being exiles, from our position as being sojourners, we still seek the welfare of this world and of the people around us, whether they are believers or not. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah. I don't think any Christian should ever say what one said to me. Um, we were we were in a group and we were going to go in and 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 knock on doors in the neighbor in neighborhoods and mm -hmm. pray for people. Okay, and what this person said was, "I don't even know my neighbors," and I said, "Really." How long have you lived there? 10 years. Wow. And I, I said, so you don't have any friends in the neighborhood? No, all my friends are right here at church. I have everything I need right here at church. And that's not the attitude of a sojourner. No, that's more like the Neo Anabaptist or, you know. Yeah. I live here, but I don't really care about here. I don't love this place. Um, right? I, how, how do you love your neighbor as yourself if you don't even know their name? I can't even find words for talking about that. Yeah. <laughs> it, just, it just, I was so uh, nonplussed about the whole, about that whole concept. Yeah. I just, I just couldn't understand that because this was a person who had occupied various positions in the church, mm -hmm. was on the board, sang in the choir, had a beautiful singing voice, sang in the right. choir, right. and all of that. But there yeah. was not, no interest in sharing God's love in, the, in their community. Yeah. And I think um, some of that brings up... Uh, well, it's a little convicting to me too, Richard. I know my neighbors, but I'm going like, man, I haven't been praying for their welfare that much. Yeah. You know, one of the most political things you can do is pre praying for your neighbors and praying yeah. for your enemies, the people that you think are totally opposed to what you believe is the right agenda in society. Um, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Yep. Yeah. There are some, quote, political implications of that. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> yeah. Well, this was a good discussion. Richard, right. we didn't get through everything that I sent you. Well, it's not so important to cover everything. It's important to uncover something. Uncover, yeah. Try to dig deep. And um, for some of you who are watching, you might be going like, but um, you really haven't gotten into politics a lot. I mean, who should I? This isn't going to be about who you're supposed to vote for. This is going to be on how you conduct yourself as a Christian in this world and how in politics as well, which I'm involved in by voting and talking about issues, how I still conduct myself, not by the rules of politics, whatever they might be uh, in this or not by the rules of what society think is right, but by the rules of God's kingdom and the character of Jesus, um, which is speaking truth in love, which is uh, still addressing issues, but not not the way the world's been doing it. Um, well, and, and the other the other thing is um, when it a political issue comes up, you've got to, you've got to trust the spirit within you mm -hmm. to lead you to a solution. Yeah. It's, and it, there, there is um, no one can tell you 
what the right solution is usually, because a lot of the people talking are just ideologues. Right. And they have one way, their way, which, but that isn't necessarily God's way. Well, it's also assuming one is there's not a lot of intellectual humility with that because they think that no. they're fully right and they understand the situation perfectly. And secondly, they're still seeing the ultimate answers are within politics. Yes. And our ultimate answer is Jesus Christ. And um, our ultimate answers have been answered by him, his life, death, and resurrection. And politics is relative. It's penultimate. It's not, it's secondary. Uh, yeah. I think for the Christian, it's got to remain that. And um, like we've seen the research in this class, it used to be most Christian churches were pretty well divided politically, you know, that they, uh, but the church members didn't, uh, you know, they rubbed up against people of different political parties or no party at all, all the time. But the focus of their time at, uh, in a Christian church was about Christianity and that their unity was not in their political viewpoint necessarily, but in their uh, Christian convictions, their discipleship, their love for one another, their prayer for one another. And uh, we've lost a lot of that. We have mm -hmm. lost a lot of that. And I think also it's another subject, but um, politics has become the religion of America for a lot of people. Yes. Uh, it's more important than religion. It's their yeah. ultimate. And I think any times that politics or the state become your ultimate, you, you've got an idol on your hands and that's going to cause problems. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. On such a note. Any last thoughts, Richard, before we uh, close with prayer? Um, no, I, I just uh, appreciate you and uh, taking the time to do this. So yeah, thanks. I'd like to do it again with you, okay? If you're willing to do this. It's not too hard on Zoom, is it? No. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, again, for everybody, I think that First Peter 2 passage that we read, uh, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God to proclaim his marvelous marvels, your sojourners and exiles on this earth. Conduct yourself in a way that is honorable so that no one can accuse you of wrongdoing, but has to admit to your good works. Um, that's a passage we need uh, to really major on and something maybe to to simmer in all week long, okay? Uh, Richard, would you be willing to close in prayer? Sure. I'd like Thanks. to close with, with Paul's prayer in Ephesians. Oh, the please prayer. do. That's a great one. Paul of the Ephesians. Um, Father God, I, um, I would ask that uh, for all of us that you show, show us the breadth and depth and the height of the love of Christ in our lives, to enrich us, to, to enable us to listen to our, our neighbors, to enable us to speak with them uh, about your love and share your love uh, on a daily basis. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Richard. Yep. Thank you all for listening, and uh, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.